Richards. Present. Rodriguez. Rose. Here. Kalos. Here. Rosenthal. Here. Greenfield. Here. Salamanca. Present. Torres. Present. Traeger. Here. Ulrich. Here. Vaca. Here. Ballone. Here. Williams. Wills. Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Matteo. Van Bramer. Here. Speaker Mark Viverito. Thank you. Quiet in the chambers. All rise for the invocation. The invocation will be delivered by Reverend John King, the assistant to Pastor Bishop Darren A. Ferguson, Mount Carmel Baptist Church in Far Rockaway, New York, in the borough of Queens. Quiet in the chambers. Amen. Thank you, Public Advocate Letitia James. Let us pray. We ask you, Lord, to open our hearts and minds as we stay on one accord. Let us sit in your lap, Lord, as decisions are made. We ask you to bless everyone that is here and those that wanted to come but couldn't make it. Let these leaders try to stay together as they take care of yet your city, which is New York City. We pray for all people, for everyone under the sound of my voice and those that aren't under the sound of my voice. Father God, we ask you to keep your heads of protection around all of our city workers, our NYPD, FDNY, EMS, MTA workers, correction officers, doctors, hospital employees. And as we finish this gathering, let us all make it home safe. As it is and everything is in your hands, Father God, we all say amen, amen, and amen again. Please be seated. Quiet in the chambers, please. A motion to spread the invocation. Council Member Donovan Richards. Motion to spread the invocation over the entire council. Uh, I want to welcome uh, our Reverend Chaplain John King, who is the assistant to uh, one of my pastors, uh, but Pastor Bishop Darren Ferguson at the Mount Carmel Baptist Church in Far Rockaway. Reverend King's ministry takes him to the street. Excuse me, council members. Number. May we please have quiet in the chambers, please? Please, out of respect for the council member. Quiet. Thank you, public Thank advocate. You. Reverend King's ministry takes him to the street where he has ministered to all. He walks through the projects with the men's ministry of Mount Carmel, praying and helping the community on a weekly basis. Some of the people that he has ministered to are now working and living a prosperous life. He's also worked at Rochdale Village Incorporated for 20 years as a licensed New York State Public Safety Officer. He's also served as a chaplain to the 113th Precinct. Reverend King currently attends Nassau Community College where he is studying to be a funeral director. He also ministers at Jeremiah C. Gaffney's funeral home Reverend King is married to Leela King, and they have two sons and four grandchildren. I want to welcome you to the People's House, Reverend King, and uh, God bless you, and thank you for all you do. Thank you, Pastor. Adoption of minutes, Councilmember Manchaka. Move to adopt the minutes. So moved. Messages and papers from the mayor. M, excuse me, M524, submitting Nasir Sheeta for appointment to the Board of Standards and Appeals. Rules, privileges, and elections. Communication from city, county, and borough offices. None. Petitions and communications. None. Land use call-ups. M525 to M534, various applications. Coupled on call-up vote, and I ask for roll call um, on all these call-ups. Barron. Aye. Borelli. Cabrera. Aye. Chin. Aye. Cohen. Aye. Constantinidis. Aye. Cornegie. Aye. Crowley. Combo. Aye. 
Dois. Aye. Drum. Aye. Espinal. Aye. Eugene. Aye. Ferreris Copeland. Gradnik. Aye. Gentili. Aye. Gibson. Aye. Greenfield. Aye. Gordenchik. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Kalos. Aye. King. Ku. Aye. Kozlowitz. Lanceman. Lander. Levin. Aye. Levine. Aye. Mizell. Mealy. Menchaca. Aye. Mendez. Aye. Miller. Aye. Palma. Perkins. Aye. Reynoso. Aye. Richards. Aye. Rodriguez. Aye. Rose. Aye. Rosenthal. Aye. Salamanca. Aye. Torres. I vote aye. Traeger. Aye. Ulrich. Yes. Vaca. Aye. Valone. I and all. Williams. Wills. Matteo. Van Bramer. Aye. Speaker Mark Viverito. I vote aye. Crowley. Here. How do you vote, council member? I vote aye. Thank you. Today's land use call-ups are adopted by a vote of 43 in the affirmative, zero in the negative. Quiet in the chambers as we now hear from the speaker, Melissa Mock Viverito. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Thank you to my colleagues. Uh, when I started this, and I, uh, I see a lot of young people. I know there's a particular ones we're going to mention here today, but I see a lot of other young people that are shadowing council members. I'm assuming they're interns. Uh, so welcome to the chambers as you learn firsthand what this legislative body does, what we do each and every day on your behalf, on behalf of the city. So welcome here to the chambers. I also want to highlight three interns that we have here, uh, Justin Vargas, Lydell Bland, and Malika Christopher, who are here today with council members Vanessa Gibson, Richie Torres, and Barry Grudenchik. These students are spending the summer interning with our frequent partner, the Food Bank for New York City, and helping to aid in their mission of solving food insecurity across the five boroughs. I have to say, um, you know, we, we have incredible experiences and moments in this council, things that happen in our districts and across the city. Uh, but one of the initiatives, very proud of, something that was advocated by colleagues and by staff as well, I have to highlight, um, is the initiative to bring school pantries into, uh, um, uh, food pantries into our public schools. And we were able to do about 16 uh, food pantries in schools last year. And this year, based on the incredible success, unfortunately, based on the real need that exists, uh, we really went uh, and, and expanded that initiative. And we're going to have more food pantries in our public schools. But these uh, young individuals, particularly Justin and Lydell, uh, who serve in a public school in Council Member Salamanca's district, uh, interned there, help out, and showed me how the food pantry works. And the way it impacts people's lives is very moving and very touching. So thank you for, your, for what you do. Um, and thank the Food Bank for New York for being an incredible partner with us in this council, an incredible partner on behalf of families in need across this city. Um, and we applaud these young people for their interest and involvement in this uh, incredible public outreach initiative. So thank you to all of you. Uh, yes. Next, I, I want to just uh, take a moment to acknowledge some unfortunate losses, uh, both recent and past. This Sunday is going to mark the 14th anniversary of the death of Councilmember James Davis, 
um, who was assassinated in this chamber. Councilmember Davis contributed much throughout his life to this city, to this council, and, to so, and, 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 and impacted the lives of so many others. We commemorate his loss every year as a reminder of the impact of his legacy on those of who we serve today, um, who we serve today. His family is here, his mother, his brother, extended family, um, Council Member Barron, Council Member Gentili are the two remaining uh, council members. Obviously, Council Member Barron is visiting us today um, who served in this council with Davis and who were here. Uh, and it really just puts into really contrast uh, the challenges that um, we have each and every day and how vulnerable we all are. But he gave his life um, helping others, a council member, and um, was assassinated in this chamber. So we want to definitely commemorate that unfortunate, tragic um, situation uh, today. Uh, and also, obviously, on July 5th, that we lost NYPD officer Miosotis Familia, who had served the department for 12 years and lost her life in a horrifying and unprovoked attack while on patrol in the Bronx. We mourn for the loss of these inspiring New Yorkers and reiterate our commitment to combating the senseless acts of gun violence that have become an undeniable crisis in this country and that seem to go unaddressed. So I would like to ask everyone to join me in a moment of silence, if people could stand, uh, for both Councilmember Davis and uh, for Detective uh, for Detective Familia, so we could have a moment of silence. Thank you, my colleagues. So turning on to today's meeting, the council is going to begin today by voting on the appointment of Thomas Sorrentino to the Taxi and Limousine Commission, as recommended by the Brooklyn delegation. We're also going to vote on multiple land use items, including the rezoning of Whitlock and 165th Street in the Bronx to facilitate the development of two fully affordable community and residential buildings and the public siting of 4545 and 4302 8th Avenue in Brooklyn to allow for the construction of two 332-seat public primary schools serving Community School District 15. Council Member Salamanca and Menchaca respectively represent these districts, uh, and I invite them to speak on these great initiatives. So we could start with Council Member Menchaca, followed by Council Member Salamanca. Thank you, uh, Speaker Melissa Mark Verito, and I rise today to speak on two land use items that I'm really proud of. Uh, the overcrowded school crisis in the city is alive and well in my district in Sunset Park, District 15, and part of District 20. Today we'll be voting to approve those land use applications that will cite these two new schools that are urgently needed. One school will incorporate landmarked exterior sections of our neighborhood's historic but long abandoned 68th police precinct building. Sunset Park has decided, in how, has decided how to preserve our history and also help relieve the area's chronic school overcrowded overcrowding emergency. The recovery of the old 68th precinct building for this 332 seat primary school has been specifically engineered to preserve the landmarked brick exterior. For over 30 years, the structure has suffered damage and decay in private hands. Now it will return to permanent public ownership and service to our young people. I congratulate local schools and preservation advocates, School District 15, Community Board 7, along with the local residents who have collaborated so carefully on this topic at many public hearings. Actions that affect landmark buildings always require re extreme care. We will continue to work with the School Construction Authority to ensure that we bring the most appropriate design uh, that respects the historic character of this unique building and inspires the next generation of young people. Thank you so much. The last thing I want to say is that over 20% of all the schools that are being cited and built in the city right now are coming to Sunset Park. That is a victory in and of itself where community and government are working together to address crisis. And I thank everyone tonight and today. Councilmember Salamanca. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I am pleased today to stand in support of 1125 Whitlock Avenue, which will bring over 470 units to my community in the Bronx. Uh, since first hearing about this project, I have been excited, notably because it will replace what's currently 
is a blight block of rundown garages. So needless to say, new development is welcome here. However, I work diligently with our team here at the council, HPD, and the development team to make sure that this project, one that works for our community with our specific needs in mind. As a result, I was able to successfully negotiate with all involved, and today I am happy to say that this project is one that will be built for the people of the South Bronx. As always, I fought for a wide uh, mix of affordability, including nearly 150 units at 40% of AMI or less, including large units. Uh, with the new HPD term sheets requiring a 10% set aside for the formerly homeless, we ensured that these units were of larger sizes to provide for formerly homeless families, particularly with children. I also received a commitment on local hiring uh, and uh, WMBE outreach. As a result, we have set aside at least 30% for subcontractors and laborers to foster commitment involvement. We were also able to obtain a commitment on permanent jobs, ensuring good paying jobs with benefits once the building is completed. And once the project is completed, we have ensured that there would be adequate safety, surveillance, publicly accessible open space, a new community mural, uh, lighting, and sanitation. With the approval of this project, I'm proud to say that since taking office 16 months ago, I've approved six ULERPs and have helped shape or approve over 4,000 units of affordable housing in the South Bronx. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Council Member, it's unbecoming to try to make us all look bad. <laughs> really, really. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, on the legislative side, uh, the Council will begin by voting on Introduction 1668, sponsored by Council Member Rosie Mendez which would extend the enactment date of Introduction 1233A, prohibiting the use of wild or exotic animals in circus performances and previously passed at the June 21st stated meeting, now changing it to October 1st, 2018. Council Member Mendez. Thank you, Madam Speaker. When we passed this legislation um, last month, I said we would be coming back to extend the time. Um, a business that's been running for multiple years can't change their business plan uh, and certainly we determined that uh, the time that we allowed originally in the uh, legislation was not enough so this will give uh, circuses an opportunity to comply with our legislation and they will have until October of next year to uh, make those transitions so I want to thank you Madam Speaker and my co-sponsors Councilmember Cornegy and Barron. Thank you, Council Member. Next, um, a very memorable intro based on the number of this bill, 1234-A. So the Council is going to vote on intro 1234-A, sponsored by Council Member Rafael Salamanca, which would require the Department of Transportation to provide notice to affected Council Members and Community Boards of the installation of new munimeters covering at least four contiguous block faces. Block faces. For staff, I want to thank Faiza Malik, Jonathan Maserano, Emily Rooney, Terza Nasser, Aisha Schomburg, Chima Obacher, and Kelly Taylor. Uh, Council Member Salamanca will say a few words. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned, intro 1234 will require the Department of Transportation to provide notice to effective council members and community boards of the installation of new muni meters. This bill will also allow affected council members and community boards to submit recommendations or comments to DOT about the notice and would require DOT to review recommendations or comments prior to the installation. Community boards would also be allowed to request a presentation on the installation. As many as you know, I'm a product of the local community board and strongly believe that our community boards are eyes and ears on what issues are most pressing in our neighborhoods. Since joining the council, I have depended on the five community boards that cover my district to help me in shaping policy, land use items, and a variety of other issues facing the South Bronx. Empowering them when it comes to siting on things like muni meters only works to benefit all of us, which is why I have proposed this legislation and I'm proud to have the support of 36 of my colleagues um, today. Uh, intro 1234, I believe, works to do what we were sent to do here in City Hall uh, to improve the quality of life of our constituents every way we can. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Council Member. The Council also vote on Intro 1411A, sponsored by Council Member Borelli, which would require that whenever a capital project is occurring on an athletic field under Parks Department jurisdiction, the agency implementing the project must install a linked walkway and public sidewalk if neither had existed before. I want to thank Chris Hartori, Patrick Mulvihill, Ken Grace, Chima Obacher, and Ed Atkin for support on this bill, and ask Council Member Borelli to say a few words. 
Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I, I want to thank you for uh, your support on this measure, as well as Parks Chairman Mark Levine. Uh, I want to just point out that this city has come uh, a long way in making uh, our streets safer and advocating for safer pedestrian access to different public buildings. Uh, and it should never be a, a condition of where you live, what borough you live in, or uh, what type of park you have. All children, all families, all people trying to access uh, ball fields or playgrounds should be able to do so with sidewalks. Not having a sidewalk is something that wouldn't even be considered in most parks around this city. And uh, it's, as I said earlier in, in the pre-stated press, it's one of those head scratchers on why we even need to have legislation on these things. But alas, uh, here we are. I want to uh, also add to that list of thank yous to uh, uh, my own staff, uh, Frank Mascia, as well as Amy Slattery, Brad Reed, Chris Sartori, Matt Gawalb, uh, and Ken Grace. And uh, thank you again, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Council Member. On the Parks Department trend, the Council will be voting on Intro 4078, sponsored by Council Member Jamie Vaca, which would require the Department of Parks and Recreation to provide notice of changes to capital projects greater than 10% of original contract value, greater than $500,000, to Council Members from whom the project's funding originated. Again, I want to thank Chris Artori, Patrick Mulvihill, Ken Grace, Chima Obachair, and Ed Atkin, and ask Council Member Vaca to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and many of my colleagues and I, we often fund projects in our parks to make communities more enjoyable, but the uh, reality, and I talk to you as someone that has the largest park in the city of New York in his district, Helen Bay Park, is that when we fund these projects, it takes years and years before we see a shovel on the ground. But not only that, there are often massive cost overruns, and sometimes funds are allocated differently uh, than we originally approved. So the Parks Department already has a structured capital project process, and it generally takes years from when we allocate the money to when we see the shovel. But in addition to that, there's time involved to design the project and get the funding in place and select the contractor and then finally start construction. Unfortunately, this process often involves contractors' change orders, which can endlessly hold up construction. Delays in projects often create confusion in the community and are not transparent. We need accountability when it comes to the expenditure of this money, and my bill will increase transparency by requiring the Department of Parks to proactively notify council members when there are changes to projects. When we're notified, we will be more able to effectively exercise our oversight role, make the capital process run more efficiently, and keep our communities informed about ongoing projects. I want to thank the Parks Committee for considering the legislation, and I do want to thank Parks for all the great work they do, even though it sometimes takes too much time to get it done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Intro 671A, sponsored by Council Member Paul Vallone, require the Department of Transportation to survey all intersections with traffic control signals that are adjacent to a school or park and do not currently have pedestrian countdown displays for the purpose of determining whether pedestrian countdown displays should be installed at such intersections. Um, this should be of interest to all the young people in this room that are in our public schools. This bill would also require the Department of Transportation to install pedestrian countdown displays at all intersections that the department determines should have seen such, should, ha should have such displays within two years of the completion of the survey. I want to thank Faiza Malik, Jonathan Maserano, Emily Rooney, Terza Nasser, Aisha Schomburg, Chima Obachair, Gafar Zailoff, and Kelly, Kelly Taylor for all their work on these bills, and ask Councilmember Volone to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the Chair of the Transportation Committee, Adonis Rodriguez, for their leadership and support of this, as well as my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Schott, and my Legislative and Budget Director, Amanda Zarr, for all their hard work on this piece of legislation. As this bill moves today, I'm proud to stand with our principals, teachers, parents, students, seniors in their combined fight for safety around our schools and parks. This is an issue that will be addressed now before another child or senior is injured just crossing our public streets, in our community, and through the city. The well-being of our children should be, always be our number one priority, and this bill would provide a major boost for the safety of all students and families around our schools and parks. Early this year, we held a rally in our district for safe streets and safe students, where hundreds of our neighbors and friends joined with a clear message of the seriousness and wide support on this issue. And I spoke with the administration and my colleagues to make these safety reforms a reality for our city. Without question, our seniors and students are our most vulnerable when trying to cross our intersections, as pedestrians account for 56% of all traffic fatalities, with children and seniors being the most vulnerable population. 
New Yorkers over 65 years of age make up 13% of the population and account for over one-third of all traffic fatalities. With that, I thank my fellow colleagues for the support of this bill and a special happy birthday to my daughter, Katina, on her 18th birthday tomorrow. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Council Member. When an individual is arrested, their money, vehicle, or other property is seized, vouchered, and classified by the NYPD. Introduction 1000B, sponsored by Council Member Richie Torres, would require the NYPD to publish an annual report detailing such property seized and retained in the preceding calendar year and disaggregated by borough and police precinct. Uh, it's really interesting that we are passing this bill. I mentioned it in the pre-stated because in these past couple of days, we have heard of some changes that AG Sessions is doing, particularly around seizures and making it easier for seizures to happen for people that are just um, arrested but never convicted of anything. Uh, really interesting time, and I think this is very timely that we'll be able to get information on the numbers uh, uh, of seizures and are reporting on that policy. So, and, and just see how it changes over time. Staff, I want to thank Deepa Ambercar, Beth Golub, and K uh, Casey Addison. I will ask Councilmember Torres to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, the timing of Intro 1000 is as urgent as ever before. It comes amid a decision by the Trump administration earlier in the week to reverse the civil forfeiture reforms of the Obama administration. A civil forfeiture is a process by which law enforcement can deprive you of your private property, regardless of whether you were convicted of, much less committed a crime. Both privacy and private property are bedrock principles of America's constitutional order, and the abuse of civil forfeiture has been a source of concern to both Democrats and Republicans, liberals, libertarians, and conservatives alike. The overzealous use of civil forfeiture threatens the constitutional right of every citizen to be protected from unreasonable searches and seizures without due process of law. Intro 1000 would require the police department to create a comprehensive, publicly viewable database of all property seizures in New York City. In doing so, it will bring long overdue accountability and transparency to a constitutionally dubious practice that has been shrouded in secrecy for as long as it has been in existence. Intro 1000 is a breakthrough for the cause of civil forfeiture reform, and it is one that would not have been possible without the productive partnership with the New York City Police Department, without the dedicated professionals here in the New York City Council, and without the broader criminal justice reform advocacy community. With that said, Madam Speaker, I thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to vote on Intro 1646A, sponsored by Transportation Committee Chair Idani Rodriguez, which would require for a higher vehicle basis to provide a means to allow passengers to tip their drivers using the same method of payment used to pay for the fare. On staff, I want to thank Faiza Malik, Jonathan Maserano, Emily Rooney, Terza Nasser, Aisha Schomburg, Chima Obachair, and Aminta Kilowan. And I ask the council member to say a few words. I didn't notice he was not here. He must have stepped out for one second. He will speak when he gets back. Uh, Sarah, you should have told me. Tap me. Unfortunately, he's back. Okay, council member, I am asking you to say a few words about your bill. Thank you, speaker. And, and as usually, like, you know, no doubt that your leadership is the, what allow all of us to move good legislation. And I want to thank you for all your support and also Thanks my colleague for the support of this important legislation. For the first time ever, we will require the, a, in, in the city law that there be a tipping option provided for all app-based car services in New York City. Uh, this is a major step forward for drivers who have seen wage, waves and earning fall over the past five years, especially for those whose services provided did not allow a tip option in their apps. I also want to highlight the work for the Independent Drivers Guild and all the members that they also play a major role that help us, uh, all of us to get here. We are making major waves na nationally with this move and already we are seeing the impact with the largest app-based uh, providers in the country, uh, Uber, now adding a tipping option for their drivers. According to the report by the IDG, by not including a tipping option, drivers for this large company were left for, to forego $300 million in earnings that could have been used to support the family. Indeed, Lyft, which has long had, which has long had a tipping option, has already seen its drivers take home $250 million in tips during its time operating here. 
I want to thank all the staff who played a major role in this bill. And as, again, thank you for your leadership and support on passing this bill. Thank you, Council Member. Unfortunately, New York City has one of the highest, nation's highest rates of food insecure seniors. Part of this problem stems from the fact that not enough eligible seniors enroll in or re recertify for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program known as SNAP. Introduction 1519A, sponsored by Council Member Karen Kozlowitz, would seek to increase coordination between the Department of Social Services and the Department for the Aging to promote awareness of SNAP through a public campaign targeted at seniors and their caregivers. The bill also requires the Department of Social Services, in coordination with the Department for the Aging, to establish and implement a SNAP enrollment and recertification program, ensuring that SNAP enrollment and recertification programming is taking place at all senior centers in the city. On staff, I want to thank Teresa Nasser, Asia Schomburg, Caitlin Fahey, Emily Rooney, Dohini Sampura, and Daniel Krupp, and ask Councilmember Kozlowitz to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The average Social Security benefit for a couple that both receive benefits is $2,212 a month. Unfortunately, for too many seniors, this is their sole source of income. To be clear, $2,212 is the average, and many are receiving less than that average. With such low income levels, one anticipates that there would be a reduced food intake as well as reduced quality and a reduced variety of foods amongst seniors. Currently, couples with a pre-tax monthly income of $1,736 receive a supplemental nutrition assistance program known as SNAP, benefit of $357. It is readily apparent how critical this benefit is. Yet we have too many needy seniors who are not availing themselves of this SNAP benefit. Intro 1590-19A would require the Commissioner of Social Services in coordination with the Commissioner of DIFTA to establish and implement a program to enable enrollment and recertification in SNAP at all senior centers. Such program would, at a minimum, enable seniors to enroll in SNAP assistance program in person at each senior center. Additionally, the Department of Social Services shall, in co coordination with the Department for the Aging, design and implement a public campaign to increase the awareness of seniors and their caregivers of the benefits of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. I believe this bill is an important step in increasing the nutritional safety net for seniors in our city, and I want to thank the chair of the Aging Committee, Margaret Chin, and all staff that worked on this bill. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Continuing our efforts to bring transparency and accountability to the Department of Correction, Intro 1136A, which I sponsored, would require the Law Department to provide semi-annual public reports on civil actions filed against the Department of Correction and the Department's employees, including the amount of any financial payment by the city as part of a settlement or other disposition. The Law Department would also be required to share this list with the Comptroller, the Department of Investigation, the Department of Correction, and the Board of Correction. This legislation will allow for, comprehensively, um, for comprehensive and coordinated efforts to identify trends of misconduct in our city jails, and I'm proud to sponsor it. I want to thank the staff, Josh Kingsley and Brian Crow, for working on this legislation. Uh, really important indeed. And then finally, obviously, last but not least, and I know there are many people in this room to celebrate this moment. It was a large celebration earlier today. Uh, we're going to be voting on intro 214B, sponsored by Council Members Levine and Gibson, which would require the Office of the Civil Justice Coordinator to establish programs to provide all tenants facing eviction with access to legal services within five years. As I said in my February State of the City address, the establishment of the Civil Justice Coordinator Office has been an exceptional high point for this Council, and we are proud to see the work of that office expanded. Losing your home is a devastating and life-altering alt uh, experience that should not happen simply because you don't know your rights. This attention to the needs of our most vulnerable residents will keep families together 
and in their homes, and that importance cannot be overstated as we face a concerning lack of affordable housing throughout the city. I want to thank staff, obviously Matt Gawalb, Kelly Taylor, Rob Newman, and Casey Addison. Uh, on all of these bills, obviously, you know, the staff is incredibly important. A lot of these bills are complicated, complex, a lot of conversations. This is an incredibly uh, historic moment for this council. Uh, really important, again, the leadership of Council Members Levine and Gibson in this are to be commended. Really impressed by the work of these two members and colleagues and invite them to speak on this incredible and forward-thinking legislation. Uh, with that, Council Member Levine, followed by Council Member Gibson. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker, and thank you for making civil justice one of the hallmarks of this council over the last three and a half years and for fighting so hard to make sure that the bill we're voting on today is truly outstanding. And thank you to uh, my partner in this adventure, uh, the indomitable Vanessa Gibson, uh, for your friendship and your leadership. Uh, colleagues, every year there are no fewer than 150,000 eviction cases in housing court. In some of our districts, just in single districts, there are more than 10,000 eviction cases. And we all experience this in our district offices when uh, day after day people come in having been evicted, um, sometimes heading to a homeless shelter, and we have all experienced that pain in the stomach when we realize we're talking to someone who has been evicted, who may have been able to stay in their home if only they had an attorney. It's, it, it is a devastating cost that the lack of access to representation in housing court has laid on the city for decades, for too long. And today, we're putting an end to it. Today, we are beginning a new era for tenants in New York City. Never again will anyone lose their home. Never again will anyone land in a homeless shelter only because they didn't have the money for an attorney. We are the first place in America to take this step. Cities around the country are already turning to us to follow our lead because they've been reminded of the power of local government. They are following the lead of this body, of the New York City Council. And this happened, this bill is being voted on today because of the efforts of so many of you. 42 of you who served as co-sponsors of the bill, dozens of you who took part in one of our countless demonstrations and press conferences, um, so many of you who pushed behind the scenes during the difficult months of negotiations. I want to give a special thank you to Councilmember Rosie Mendez, who for 12 years has led the fight on this access to council priority and very much laid the groundwork for this bill today. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, uh, thank you, Rory. Did Rory leave? Well, there he is. Thank you, Rory, uh, as chair of the Committee on Courts and Legal Services for pushing this through and for all your support. Thank you to Jamani, who was chair of housing, was a steadfast supporter of this bill. Thank you to Richie for making sure that the interests of NYCHA residents were always front and center and uh, for helping us to secure that not only NYCHA residents in housing court are covered in this bill, but so are NYCHA residents when they are in administrative hearings. That is really a, 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 landmark, a landmark development for us. Thank you, Jalissa, for making sure that we allocated money year after year in the budget to grow the funding for access to anti-eviction legal services, which proved out the power of this concept. And thank you to my colleagues in the Progressive Caucus, who from the first day came out united behind this bill, which gave us so much momentum. Now, none of this work, as important as it is, would have been possible without the efforts of a truly awe-inspiring coalition, the Coalition for a Right to Counsel and Housing Court, the tenants' advocates, the faith leaders, the labor allies, the intellectual godfather of this movement, Andy Scherer, and some of the most effective community organizers I've ever worked with at CASA, led by Susanna Blankley, Randy Diller, Carmen Rivera, and so many others. And finally, I have to thank the staff who did utterly phenomenal work on this bill over the past three and a half years. Laura Papa, Rob Newman, Matt Gawalb, Kelly Taylor, Jen Wilcox, my own legislative director, the amazing and much loved Amy Slattery, my incredible communications director, Jake Sporn, and my chief of staff, Aya Keefe, who poured her heart and soul and brilliance and determination into leading this effort. Thank you to everyone 
Uh, thank you for your votes today. I'm excited that we're making history. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Madam Public Advocate. Good afternoon to all of my colleagues. Um, I am just so overwhelmed with joy and pride. I stand before you as a humble servant, so honored that today we are passing intro 214. This three-year journey, colleagues and everyone here, has been an incredible journey, and today we take a bold step forward in our ongoing efforts to reduce and prevent evictions, to stabilize families, to keep our tenants in their homes, and to reduce the burden on our shelter system. After so much advocacy, rallying, marching together, the demonstrations, the countless hours of labor, of love, we will see this groundbreaking legislation passed that will curb the homelessness epidemic. I am so proud and honored. This afternoon, we will truly make history by voting to protect so many New Yorkers' right to fairness and equity in housing court. And as a representative of all the courts in Bronx County, I can tell you on average in the Bronx, 11,000 families are evicted in Bronx County. And we know those are the documented cases. We know that affects children, families, seniors, those that are living well below the federal poverty level. So we are truly making a difference. This legislation, intro 214, affirms what we all know and believe. Housing is not a luxury, but a fundamental right. It is a right that is guaranteed by our democracy. So thanks to all of the protections in 214, right to counsel, we will truly decrease the number of evictions, stabilize our families, reduce the burden on our shelters, and truly maintain long-term and affordable housing for thousands of tenants and families. Over the next five years, as this legislation is implemented, we at the City Council will work very closely with the administration to make sure that all New Yorkers have the legal protections, including those residents who live in the New York City Housing Authority. And I represent 12 NYCHA developments, and they too are struggling to remain in their homes, and many are facing the everyday threat of evictions. More and more New Yorkers will grow to understand and truly be empowered by their rights as tenants. Through this legislation, we're providing tenants with attorneys, thereby leveling the playing field in eviction proceedings. Knowledge is power, but having an attorney is even more powerful. And we truly believe in all of the vision that this bill always set out for. This bill will make critical investments in many New York families, and when we invest in families, we invest in our children, and when we invest in our children, we give them hope for tomorrow and a future. I have been so blessed and honored to work on this important legislation alongside our colleague, Councilmember Mark Levine, whose dedication and determination and commitment has been a huge factor in getting us here today. Thank you so much, Mark, for everything, for always working hand in hand to make sure that this bill was passed. I also want to thank our mayor, Bill de Blasio, for his leadership and support. Our council speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, for your commitment to fairness and equity for so many tenants. Thank you so much. And also holding firm and making sure that the final bill included tenants of NYCHA, because that was a goal for all of us. I also want to thank and recognize Chair of Public Housing, Richie Torres, Chair of Courts and Legal Services, Rory Lansman, Chair of Housing and Buildings, Jamani Williams, for all of their support all of our co-sponsors. I also want to thank Councilmember Rosie Mendez for her longtime support of this issue. I also want to thank the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, as well as the Progressive Caucus. And the staff that has been acknowledged, Matt Gowalb, Laura Popa, Rob Newman, Casey Addison, Sarah Gastelum, Kelly Taylor, Aya Keefe, and my own Chief of Staff, Dana Wax. To all of the advocates who have supported this legislation over the years, thank you. 
It would be impossible to name everyone, but certainly I too want to join Councilmember Levine in recognizing Andy Shera and the New York Law School. I also want to thank my foundation and my solid rock in the Bronx. They never, ever let me forget how important Intro 214 is. Many of them live and work and raise their families in our district, and this would not be possible without the hard work of Casa Bronx. Susana Blankley, Shayla Garcia, Randy Dillard, Fitzroy Christian, Carmen Vega Rivera, Mildred James, Emmanuel Youssef, and the entire family of CASA. The Right to Counsel Coalition, Housing Court Answers, Legal Aid Society, Bronx Defenders, Central Labor Council, DC 37, Urban Justice Center, Legal Services, NIMIC, Goddard Riverside, and all of our civil legal service providers. Also want to recognize Catholic Charities and our biggest champions for seniors who we never forgot about, Live On New York and AARP. Mm -hmm. Also want to thank our public advocate, Tish James, for being with us from the beginning. Our Comptroller, Scott Stringer, for his support. We want to thank all of the borough presidents. I especially want to recognize my Bronx borough president, Ruben Diaz, Jr. Thank you all for your tireless commitment and your partnership that has really allowed us to make history, to make this city a model for so many other municipalities throughout this country. Thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of my district for helping to make a difference and invest in tenants and families in the entire city of New York. Yes, we can, and yes, we did. Thank God. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I like to, I like to remind um, people, who I, I, I say it enough, but um, I proudly represent the most public housing in this country between my district of East Harlem and the South Bronx. I have by far the most public housing in the city of New York, so that is always going to be a priority for me. Um, and we are in speaker time, so you know what? Let's hoop and holler. Go for it. <laughs> a big deal, so definitely some emotion is warranted. Um, and that ends communication from the speaker. I say CASA, you say power. CASA. Power! That's it. Dis <laughs> discussion, of <clears throat> discussion of general orders, seeing none. Report of special committees. None. Reports of standing committees. Report of the Committee on Aging, mm -hmm. intro 1519A, SNAP benefits. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Courts and Legal Services, intro 214B, legal services for tenants facing eviction. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Finance, preconsidered Reso 1589, organization funding. Coupled on general orders. Preconsidered LU 706 and Reso 1590 tax exemption. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Health. Preconsidered intro 1668, prohibition of circus performances with wild animals. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I mean, uh, yeah. Report on the Committee of Land Use. I had said. Couple on general orders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Report of the Committee on Land Use, LU 682 and Reso 1591 to LU 689 and Reso 1594 zoning amendments. Couple on general orders. LU 690 and Reso 1595 to LU 705 and Reso 1597 HPD applications. Couple on general orders. Preconsidered LU 707 and Reso 1598 and LU 708 and Reso 1599 school facilities. Couple on general orders. Report of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations, Intro 1136A, Report on Civil Actions Against Correct. Officers. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Parks and Recreation, Intro 407A, Parks Department Capital Projects. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 1411A, Pedestrian Access to Park Facilities. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Public Safety, Intro 1000B, Report on Seized Property. 
Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections, M521 and Reso 1600, approving the appointment of Thomas Sorrentino, Taxi and Limousine Commission. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Transportation, Intro 671A, Pedestrian Countdown Displays. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 1234A, Munimeter Installations. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 1646A, Gratuity for Four Hire Vehicles. Amended and coupled on general orders. On the general order calendar, LU 651 and Reso 1601 to LU 655 and Reso 1604 zoning amendments. Coupled on general orders. Resolution appointing various persons, Commissioner of Deeds. Coupled on general orders and I ask for roll call on all general order items. Shh. May we have quiet in the chambers? And Baron. Thank you. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Thank you. I wanted to uh, commend the prime sponsor, Rosie Mendez, and proudly say that I'm a I'm co-sponsor on 1668. I think that it's important that as we look at what has been a tradition in the black community, particularly for nearly 25 years, be given an opportunity to continue. When they first started the Soul Circus in the mid-1980s, I was the executive assistant to the community superintendent, Carlos Edwards. And he realized the significance of that circus, being black owned and having blacks in significant positions. And he worked with the circus to have every school in the district be able to send a group of children to participate in witnessing that. So I'm so pleased that the sponsor has had an opportunity to be able to extend that bill. And we're going to look to see if in fact there might be other extensions that are granted. So I'm pleased to be a co-prime sponsor on that. And I'm voting aye on all the others with the exception of LU, I think it's 690, 691, and 692, which is the Bedford Arms project. And my concern is that this project, while it has 80, 60, and 40% uh, AMI apartments available, it has 50% of the apartments at market rate. And this is in a community where the average neighborhood median income is only $40,000. So it's, in fact, not addressing the issue of those families that are close to homelessness. And so for that reason, I'm abstaining on those. Thank you. Thank you. And now for a vote, Councilmember Gentile. Thank you, uh, Madam Public Advocate. Uh, with my congratulations to all my colleagues, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Borelli. I and all accept 214B, 1646, and 1136. Cabrera. Fold I, and I'd like to congratulate all the sponsors of the bill, and I'd like to welcome Casa in the house. Thank you. Chin. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. First, I want to congratulate all my colleagues on passing important legislation, and I especially want to and I'm going to be proud to vote for intro 214B. Um, access to legal representation should be a fundamental principle of a more fair and equitable city. Residents who are facing eviction and are already struggling with financial or language barrier should not have to go to housing court on their own. As the first municipality in the country to guarantee universal access to counsel, for tenants with eviction cases, our city is, getting a strong, is setting a strong example for how our nation can lead the fight against displacement and homelessness. I wanted to thank our speaker, Melissa Moffrey-Varito, uh, Councilmember Levine, and Councilmember Gibson for their commitment uh, and their leadership on this, and of course my sister, Rosie Mendez, who's been pushing for universal access uh, for legal services for many years, and especially for our seniors. And I also want to thank the coalition and all the advocates who worked so hard on this, because we are protecting our most vulnerable residents in private housing and in public housing. I am proudly voting aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Cohen. I, I vote aye. Constantinidis. I vote aye. Carnegie. I vote aye. Crowley. I vote aye. Combo. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. I just want to congratulate all of my colleagues, and I particularly want to 
congratulate Council Members Gibson and Levine on this landmark legislation that is certainly going to change the atmosphere and the dynamic for so many people. As a council member in the heart of gentrification uh, all throughout my district, this is going to make the difference between someone staying in their home or being evicted and then sent off to our homeless shelters. So I applaud you. I support you. This is incredible landmark legislation. This is going to make the difference for so many families throughout New York City. And I know that it is going to be the type of legislation that is going to be a model throughout not only New York City, but also the nation and the world where gentrification has reared its ugly head. So I congratulate my colleagues and I congratulate all who have passed legislation today. Thank you. Thank you. Deutsch. Aye. No. Drum. Aye. Espinal. 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 I vote aye. Thank you. Sorry. Eugene. I vote aye. Ferreris Copeland. I, uh, with congratulations to all my colleagues, I vote aye. Grodnik. No. I vote aye. Gibson. With my warmest congratulations to all of my colleagues passing legislation today, I proudly vote aye on all. Thanks. Greenfield. I vote aye with the exception of preconsidered Reso 1589, on which I abstain, and I congratulate all my colleagues. Gordenchik. Madam Public Advocate, permission to explain my vote? Yes. Actually, I'm not doing much explaining. I'm doing more introducing. Um, next to me today is Malika Christopher. I wish she were my constituent um, because in the few minutes that we spent together, I know that she is an outstanding young woman. Uh, she's a graduate of the York Early College Academy where she earned 60 credits. Wow. Um, and is also a graduate of York College CUNY. Hmm. Um, she's now working with the Food Bank for New York City um, but is inspiring me because she told me that she will be spending a year working with AmeriCorps and uh, working with reading partners. Mm. So I'm very excited to have her with me today. Um, I want to congratulate especially uh, on the legislation, landmark legislation, uh, my colleagues Mark Levine and Vanessa Gibson. I've often wondered why we don't provide counsel for more people and now we will be doing it for all. And lastly, I know that today is the 48th anniversary uh, when mankind first set foot on the moon. We were able to do that a long time ago, and I hope that Americans can be inspired to work together once again for the common good. With that, I vote aye on all. Thank you, and congratulations to that young leader. Thank you for your leadership. Johnson. I want to congratulate Mark Levine and Vanessa Gibson, and I vote aye on all. Thank you. Kalos. Congratulations, uh, Mark and Vanessa, and tenants throughout our city. I vote aye on all. Ku. I vote aye on all. Kozlowitz. I vote aye on all and congratulate uh, all my colleagues on their legislation. Lanceman. Yes. Levin. Uh, aye on all and congratulations to all my colleagues. Levine. Madam Public Advocate, may I have permission to thank the Public Advocate for her eloquent and unwavering support of Intro 214? <laughs> yes. Great. I'd also like to vote aye on all. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Maizel. Yes. Mealy. Aye on all. Menchaca. Aye on all. Mendez. Permission to explain my vote? Yes, Council Member. I um, want to congratulate Council Members Levine and, and Gibson for getting over the finish line, what I could not do for so many years. Um, I started my career 30 years ago as a tenant organizer. Eventually, I became a legal services lawyer. I am so proud to be part of this body and voting on this bill today. Thank you for making this happen in my last and final year in the City Council, and congratulations to everybody in the balcony and everyone in New York City. It's a big win-win. Thank you. I vote aye on all. And it's your legacy. Miller. Permission to explain? Yes. So I'd really like to congratulate uh, 
my colleagues on this landmark legislation, really, really important legislation that is thoughtful and is necessary. But there is a caveat involved here, and that caveat that one third of the city, uh, uh, including my district of one and two family homeowners, have not been excluded. That many of these homeowners, their mortgages are predicated on these rentals. And there has uh, been an inordinate problem that my office has been uh, involved in uh, a along with that. So we are hoping that during this five year phasing um, implementation period, that there is an opportunity for us to address the issues of those homeowners, which often who find themselves in this position continue to proliferate the foreclosure crisis that many suffer from over there. So this is thoughtful, it is absolutely necessary, but I'm totally looking to engage that. And, and I did reach out to uh, Council Member Levine, and we've had preliminary discussions on that as well as the speaker. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with them on this, but I would have to abstain on 214B and 1668 and I own all the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Perkins. Uh, congratulations to all and I vote aye on all. Thank you. <clears throat> Reynoso. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Richards. Congratulations to all my colleagues. I vote aye. <clears throat> Rodriguez. Rose. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Um, uh, first, I'd like to welcome uh, to the chamber two, in, two of my interns, Emma Franco and Adair Martinez. They are interns extraordinaire. And, oh, the um, CFE. Oh. Excuse me? Sorry. Oh. Continue, Council Member. Okay. Um, and I wanted to welcome them. Um, here and acknowledge their presence. Um, I want to congratulate Council Members Levin and Levine and Gibson for 214A uh, B for the historic legislation that this is and for putting tenants on equal footing. But I also would like to ditto the remarks that um, Council Member Miller made about private homeowners um, who also need to have some protections. And um, in my land use um, item today, I want to thank land use staff, Raju Mann, Amy Levitin, and John Douglas, and my chief of staff, Christine Johnson, for the work that they did on this land use item. Um, it is a waterfront project that will bring 371 units of affordable and market rate housing, commercial and retail development, and a public walkway along our waterfront when waterfront access is so important. Throughout this process, I've worked with the applicants to modify this project to ensure that it is in alignment with my priorities, which are environmentally responsible, affordable, and aesthetically pleasing, and preserving access to the waterfront for all Staten Islanders. So I, I want to um, thank all of the land use staff for helping us move this along. And I vote aye on all. Thank you. Rosenthal. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. I uh, just want to congratulate all my colleagues on their bills. There's just some amazing legislation here. I'm sorry I wasn't able to sign on to the speaker's bill um, that was passed by the Committee on Oversight and Investigations yesterday. It's a great bill. I really applaud you for this legislation. And of course, want to congratulate my colleagues Levine and Gibson for making my job in the district office a lot easier now that we can give people a lawyer. It's going to make all the difference. Uh, and with that, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Salamanca. Aye on all. Thank you. Torres. Uh, permission to briefly explain my vote. I just want to thank the speaker, Councilmember Levine, and Councilmember Gibson for fighting for a genuinely inclusive version of right to counsel. Uh, NYCHA residents are no less entitled to legal representation, and so I'm proud of the end product. With that said, I vote aye. Thank you. Traeger. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, thank you. And I just uh, also want to just add to the enormous thanks and gratitude uh, to Council Members Mark Levine and Council Member Vanessa Gibson for their signature piece of legislation. I want to thank Council Member Rosie Mendez for being a trailblazer on this issue. 
And uh, as just we, we just heard from my colleague, I want to thank the speaker and Councilmember Richard Torres as well for making sure that NYCHA residents are a part of this legislation. It, 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 it would be the height of hypocrisy for the city to make sure that all tenants will be protected and leave out some of the most vulnerable in our NYCHA buildings. They too matter. They matter a lot. So I want to thank all my colleagues, thank the, the staff as well. Uh, this, is, this is a big deal. And I, with that, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Ulrich. Uh, I vote aye on all except uh, intros 214B and uh, 1646A. Becca. I vote aye on all. Valone. Aye on all. Matteo. Um, no on 214, 1646, 1136, and I and the rest. Van Bramer. I and all. Speaker Mark Viverito. I urge my colleagues to sign on to 1670, a bill requiring major construction sites to post and regularly update a sign indicating the number of workers present. It would help us monitor and deter the overmanning of construction sites and prevent accidents that happen because sites are congested and inadequate planning has led to poor workflow. Second, in the immediate aftermath of an accident, the signage would help ensure that every worker is accounted for and this information would provide an invaluable data point. I urge all of my colleagues to sign on to this bill. All items on today's general order calendar were adopted by a vote of 46 in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions, with the exception of land use 690 and resolution 1595, which was adopted by a vote of 45 in the affirmative, one negative, and, one, and zero abstentions, and intro 214B, which was adopted by a vote of 42 in the affirmative, three negative, and one abstention, and intro 1646A, which was adopted by a vote of 43 in the affirmative, three negative, and zero abstentions, and intro 1136A, which was adopted by a vote of 44 in the affirmative, two negative, and zero abstentions, and resolution 1589, which was adopted by a vote of 45 in the affirmative, zero negative, and one abstention, and intro 1668, which was adopted by a vote of 45 in the affirmative, zero negative, and one abstention, and the revised land use call-up vote is now 46 in the affirmative, zero in the negative and no abstentions. Introduction and reading of bills. All bills refer to the appropriate committees. There's no resolutions this, e this afternoon, and so our first um, member for general discussion is Council Member Lori Cumbo. Thank you. I want to thank Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito and all of my colleagues today Shh. for recognizing the memory and the legacy of the late, great James Davis. He continues to be uh, a memory that we all can draw inspiration from. I want to applaud his brother, Jeffrey Davis, for not only keeping his brother's memory alive, but keeping the work alive. I think all of us throughout the 35th Council District and the City of New York know the Love Yourself, Stop the Violence motto. And that has transitioned all throughout the City of New York where people understand that gun violence and the epidemic of gun violence is a mental disorder and it's something that we as a community have the power to overcome. And we have the power to change that dynamic. So I want to thank the Davis family for coming here today for keeping their brother's memory alive, and for us allowing us in the council to know just how blessed we are to be here. I also want to bring attention to gender-based violence. All New Yorkers, regardless of gender, should feel safe in their homes and communities. Violence against women has become too commonplace in the city of New York. We cannot continue to proclaim that we are the safest city in the United States until gender-based violence ends. In the past week, news headlines have been dominated by women who were victims of gun violence or sexual assault. Police arrested two individuals for the kidnapping and prostitution of two 16-year-old girls who were held captive in a Crown Heights apartment. One was allegedly forced to have sex with three men, while the other victim was forced to have sex with at least 18 men. 
July 12th, there were four rape attempts within four hours in Crown Heights. Each woman fought off the suspect and were uninjured. The alleged suspect has not been apprehended by the police. July 12th, two mothers shot and killed at Stuyvesant Garden Houses in Bedford-Stuyvesant. China Battle 21 was shot once in the head, and Shaquanda Staley 29 was found with three bullet wounds in the back. Police believe that there were, they were not intended targets. And July 18th, Noreen Molzak, 70, was found dead and tied up with an electrical cord in her Canarsie home. In 19, on July 19th, an unidentified woman, 40, was stabbed multiple times in Clinton Hill. As a city, we must remain vigilant and continue to dedicate the resources, right. example, police presence, funding, and year-round programming to combat Thank all you. forms of violence. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Miller. <laughs> Donovan Richard says that you should have more minutes because of your condition. <laughs> Councilmember Miller. No, you pass? Okay. Councilmember Gibson. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I just quickly want to expand on the speaker's remarks earlier in recognizing many of our wonderful interns who are here with the Food Bank of NYC and specifically the incredible measure that this council provided in the adopted budget of additional funds for our school campus pantry and making sure that we can increase opportunities for many school students in our public schools to access healthy food. Um, I am so proud to have been shadowed today by one of our interns, Lydell Bland, who was a recent graduate of East Bronx Academy for the Future in the Bronx, and now he is going to BMCC, him and his twin brother, and he is going to be studying business and economics. And just talking to him this afternoon, I also had a chance to meet him at the annual gala hosted by Food Bank. And I am telling him, his twin brother, as well as all of our other interns, they are the future leaders. And we are so grateful that if anyone could lead the conversation in taking a huge bite out of hunger, in being an advocate, and being the champions of change, it is our young people. And so we pride ourselves on the work we do, not just talking about it, but investing money where our commitment is, and I'm so proud, and I look forward to seeing Lydell in the future. I told him that as a resident of the Bronx, he always has an opportunity to work with us or any of my other colleagues in the Bronx, but I'm looking forward to great things from each and every one of you. Good luck in college, good luck in school, and thank you for all you're doing, and good luck to you this summer. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Thank you. We're very proud of you, and thank you for your leadership. And our last speaker is Council Member Margaret Chin. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Good afternoon. I wanted to point my colleagues' attention to Reso 1586, which urges the state legislature to increase penalties for individuals who assault or rob food delivery workers. Being a delivery worker continues to be one of the more dangerous jobs that an individual can have. In 2015, delivery workers suffer 885 fatalities nationwide, the greatest number of fatal injuries amongst civilian occupations. 236 of these incidents happen in New York, which rank fourth among the states with the highest fatal work injuries. Food delivery workers are particularly vulnerable to assault and robbery due to the job's requirement to carry cash. Furthermore, a large number of food delivery workers are from immigrant communities and have limited English proficiency, creating a language barrier between the victims and law enforcement. By increasing the penalty for individuals who attack delivery workers, we can send a clear message to those who prey upon these vulnerable workers. This is unacceptable, and we will no longer stand for this. I want to thank Casey Addison for working on this resolution, and I urge my colleagues to sign on. Thank you. Thank you. And now the speaker to close. All right, it is 3.35 and we're out. Thank you all and Thank you. Uh, we are adjourned. And may James Davis rest in peace. <laughs>